All right. Hello, everybody. Today we're going to talk about, we're nearing the end of this assignment about the new imperialism. So we're going to be talking about one of the items that you'll be engaging with. It's about an hour and 40 minute long, powerful Academy Award winning documentary film called Virunga. Virunga. It was done in 2004 and I just recently read a news clip about how uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and another famous director, I'm sorry, I forget his name, are creating um, a film version of this powerful documentary. Okay, here are some questions, five questions you're going to be answering as you watch the film. And then I believe the due date for this is the 19th or so. So you have um, three, four days. And if you get it in on the later than that, a couple days later, that's fine too. My goal is for you all to have kind of a Thanksgiving break that's actually a break, okay, where you don't have much work to do. I will be uploading assignment uh, three, but assignment three is gonna be a lot shorter than these first two, okay, significantly shorter. There's not a big book to read. It's gonna be a series of articles and films, okay? So Virunga National Park. Um, Virunga National Park is located on the eastern boundary of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, what was King Leopold's Congo back in the day. And it also borders um, the former British colonies of Uganda, right here, and the former German colonies, R Rwanda, Burundi, and Tanzania. All right, and this little orange place. So, uh, Sorry, Becky, I'm sorry, Hannah, can you make this out? How's the visuals? Are they working well? Yeah, I can see okay. everything fine. Okay. <clears throat> so this national park was created in 1925 and I'll get to that in a second. But some of the conflict uh, today about the national park, geez, for the last 15, 20 years, is that <clears throat> it has one of the highest populations of the gorilla, right? The African mountain gorilla. Here's a profile of the African mountain gorilla. And as you can see, there are oil wells, right? Pumping oil out of this area. This area is very resource rich, not only with oil, but with diamonds and cobalt and all these rare earth minerals that are highly, highly prized right now. So there's a fight over how this land is gonna be used. Is it gonna be used for resource extraction or is it going to be somehow preserved for the for gorillas. Okay. And it's not just gorillas, I'll get to that in a second. So back to the history of the park. Uh, king Albert the First, King of Belgium, Albert the First, in 1925, decided to set aside, remember, Belgium, um, the Congo was a Belgian colony until 1961. So he set aside Virunga National Park in order to protect the mountain gorilla and to increase tourism. And this is nothing new. What, um, uh, Hannah or Emma, if I can pick on you, do you know of any old timey, what are some of the oldest national parks in the United States? Do you know it all? And saying, I don't is know. Is Yellowstone that old? Yeah, Yellowstone is the first, 1872, I believe was established by Congress to protect the landscape and also to um, bring tourism. The railroad companies in the United States were a big lobbyist to have Yellowstone National Park be um, set aside as a place where people can recreate. And they would buy train tickets to get there. So King Albert was following in the United States footsteps and wanted to protect the mountain gorilla. And in order to bring tourists to this area in order to somehow get some sustainable investment to this area of his colony. So they created, he created what they called the Congolese Institute for Nature Conservation. And here's just an old tiny map of it. It's really blurry and you can't probably make anything out, which is fine. Maybe not fine for you, but it'll do. And again, um, this is a very mountainous region and it's on the borderline. So there's all these, it's what we call a liminal space where all these different things come together. And all these former colonies are coming together right there and a lot of um, biodiversity. 
So come the post-World War II waves of these colonies fighting and winning their independence, right? Angola, Tanzania, you're all gonna be reading about Kenya, um, Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, and these countries right here uh, won their independence from Belgium and other European countries uh, after World War II in the, 19, in the 1960s for their case. And then <clears throat> as your book talks about towards the end, um, in the context of the Cold War where you had the United States and the USSR vying for global superiority and alliances throughout the world, Patrice Lumbumba was elected in what the State Department at the time called Congo's freest election. And historians even argue today that the 1960 election was the freest the Congolese have ever had. In other words, elections since then have been just dirty, corrupt, kleptocratic elections. That means people stealing, uh, stealing the election. So um, Hannah or Emma, do you all remember what happened to Patrice Lumb uh, Lumbumba? I think you read about him towards the end of the book. He was assassinated, wasn't he? Yeah, do you remember why at all? Because, oh, I think the United States, oh, no, there was this guy who, oh. They didn't like his views, and so yeah, they- I don't remember if the US did it or this guy who they were working for, I mean, working with did it. Yeah, he was a little too pro-Soviet for the United States. In other words, he was playing the two big superpowers at the time, the USA and the USSR off of each other in order to try to negotiate better terms for the Congo. So like many quote, uh, so-called third world countries that were trying to play off the USSR in the US, he was too. And many powerful forces within the Congo um, and also with the support of the CIA, I uh, had him assassinated, not even a year after he was elected. Yeah, so here's one of the last photos of him alive. He was assassinated. And um, a couple years later, one of the heads of the Congolese military rose to the top and became dictator. I'm not gonna call him president because he wasn't a president. He was a, a dictator all the way until 1997, right? 67, 80, 90. I have to use my fingers when I do math. So 30 years uh, dictator of the Congo and he led with an iron fist, right? He followed a lot of the institutional trappings of the Congolese colonial regime under the Belgians, right? He utilized his version of the force publique to control things. There was no religious, uh, no political liberties. His enemies would be just crushed but he was allied to with the United States because at least here's him with this um, fancy hat right here talking to President Nixon, US President Nixon in 1973. Um, there was an old saying in US foreign policy circles that he may be a SOB, but at least he's our SOB. In other words, at least he's not allied with the Soviets. So we will, you know, with the greatest salt swallow, with the grain of salt swallow, you know, the horrors he's committing in the Congo. And what dictator, um, with respect to Virunga, um, uh, Sesi Seko is what everybody called him, Sesi Seko. He protected Virunga. He wanted foreigners to come in. He wanted to present a positive image of the Congo to the world, right? And so many thousands of foreigners came in, mostly wealthier Europeans and Americans would come in to see these, you know, these mountain gorillas. But on the other hand, he also profited, personally profited from all kinds of things, but personally profited from the illegal hunting of elephants and gorillas and other um, animals in the Congo. That's called poaching, when you illegally profit from hunting. However, uh, tourism flourished. Uh, scientists were allowed safe passage to go study gorillas, right? And here's some folks just checking out some gorillas. If you didn't know much about gorillas, would you feel comfortable being that close to them? Um, absolutely not. I know how dangerous they are. Yeah, they can get aggressive quickly, especially if they're scared. Yeah, and so can these guys over here with the guns. So don't worry too much. 
These yeah. are the Rangers, these guys on the left. But I do have a question though. Yeah. This guy was a dictator yeah. and he was killing all these animals and it was called poaching. Well, Why he, was, he, like, how was it? Yeah. How was right. it illegal if he if if he was the dictator and he probably was okay with it? All right, that's a good question. That's a good um, <clears throat> because according to the um, the mission statement and the Congolese law, the Congolese Institute for Nature Conservation said in writing at least, you all know about this reading King Leopold's Ghost. It's one thing to have something in writing; it's another thing to enforce it. Does that make sense, uh, Hannah? Yes. Yeah, so on paper it looked like, oh, what a wonderful place where they're just protecting these exotic creatures. No, not exotic, but these mountain gorillas. However, um, he also did personally profit from poaching. Of course, he didn't announce that in public and say, woohoo, I got another $10,000 for this, you know, elephant paw or elephant tusks or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So let's fast forward to the late 1990s. Um, the late 19, the mid 1990s, uh, Mobutu Sese Seko is still in control. There's no democratic openness. He's still allied with the United States, while Angola down here is allied with the USSR. So the Cold War in Africa played out right, right here. This is the Cold War played out. Uh, the Cold War was very hot in many places around the world. Angola was pro-USSR, Democratic Republic of Congo, pro-US. So snapshot, mid-90s, about 81 million people lived in the Congo. The wealthiest region, and this is what the film Virunga is about, is going to be about this eastern part. And when I say wealth, I mean uh, mineral wealth. Right, The curse of the Congo is it has all this mineral wealth. And you can tell these are the mountains. If you all, if you all are into reading maps, do you see how all the rivers start right here? The lines of the rivers get smaller and smaller. That means that's where the headwaters are. Headwaters are these rivers, right? And they go all the way and form into the Big Congo Basin. Um, in 1997, I'm sorry, was that a question? No. In 1997, Mobutu Sese Seko died and this created a power vacuum because often what happens when a dictator who runs, who rules through personal charisma and has not created any institutional institutions that will right, survive his death. For example, if the United States didn't create the Congress and the Senate and all kinds of federal institutions, when George Washington died, maybe this nation would have just had a diff much different history. Well, uh, Ceci Seco died without having created any other political outlets, right? There was no freedom of political voice. It was just him, he was the state. So when he died without a successor, there was a civil war that erupted beginning then and it's still going today, right? This is over two decades of civil war and there's so many, you, do you see all these arrows? Arrow, 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 arrow. All these different interests from the South, North, East and West are moving in, when I say different interests, I mean armed rebel groups who are supported by local leaders, right? Local mafioso types and even local political leaders, but also supported by like say the Chinese government. These again, why would, for example, many different folks want to get a piece of this pie over here? What did I mention is really, really sought after? There were rich minerals there. A bunch of them, all these things, uh, coltan, copper, cobalt, zinc, gold, and a few, um, a few items that go on our screens, right? We all have one of these silly screens that we touch way too often. A lot of the fine earth, rare earth metals um, that go into making these, somebody else is here, that go into making these are found there. Okay. I think that's Justin. We'll have to wait and see. Oh, Evan, fashionably late as usual, but it's nice to see you, Evan. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, Evan, Hannah, and Chris. 
So another aspect of this, let me go back to this. <clears throat> the reason I, can you see those little tents there? Those are refugee camps, because if you remember from that lecture when we call uh, discussed the weaponization of ethnicity and how that led to, for example, a genocide in Rwanda, right, between the Hutus and the Tutsis, um, a lot of folks here suffering from civil war um, ran away, right, and escaped into the Eastern Congo, right, because it's a kind of a vast <clears throat> uh, jungly place. Right, much more so than the uh, densely populated areas of Rwanda. So all these tents are refugee camps for various folks living over here. <clears throat> and it's very diverse. The reason I show you this map with all these different colors and names is just so you get an idea of the ethno-linguistic diversity. I know I've probably redundancies my middle name as a teacher, but We've talked about over and over again about how ethno-linguistically diverse Africa is, and especially the Congo area. So this is the area we are talking about here, all these different peoples. So fast forward to Virunga, uh, Virunga the movie. Here is a poster for Virunga the movie, which you'll be watching. Um, Evan, Hannah's going to watch it tonight. Maybe you can have a Share watching night, whatever y'all call that. I forget what you call that. <clears throat> Not at the same place, socially distanced, but just on your screens. So interestingly, this guy on the right, right? He's a Belgian prince named Emmanuel Merod. He's also the chief warden of Virunga. He's the boss of Virunga, this guy here. He will play prominently in the film you're gonna watch. And another prominent person in the film is this park ranger who's one of the chief guys who takes care of the um, gorillas, Andre Bauma. <clears throat> Andre Bauma grew up um, and was recruited, forcefully recruited into one of the Congolese rebel armies. He was a child soldier um, in the Congo. Uh, he saw family members die, right? Many folks die in the civil war and he somehow got out of it, they don't explain in the movie, but he got out of it and became one of the chief park rangers in Virunga to help protect the animals. Another person you're gonna meet in the documentary is Melanie Gouvet. It's this woman here, she's a French journalist and talk about, woof, a brave journalist. She goes in there all by herself, right? And she uncovers what's going on in Virunga. And a lot of it parallels, not to the extent, but a lot of it parallels what you all read about in King Leopold's Ghost, right? A story of greed, terror, and heroism. And she is definitely one of the heroes of the, the documentary. And so are these two guys here, I think. And you're also gonna um, look at Rodrigue Catembo, Talk about another just brave hero. He goes in and uncovers as well what's going on in Virunga, this national park. And what's going on is even though this national park, right here, the green, dark green stuff, on paper, it's protected by the Congolese law, right, on paper. However, as I mentioned, Congo is an extremely corrupt, the Congo, Congolese government is extremely corrupt right, and very susceptible to bribes, as are many, many governments. And the reason why there's so much money flowing into this region, as I keep saying, there's a lot of resources, right, diamonds, dun, dun, dun. in this case, oil, right, there's been a large finding of oil in Lake Edward, and Lake Edward's named after um, a British royalty, and same with Lake Victoria after British royalty. Oh, that's right, you all read about how, um, Henry Morton Stanley named all these things, right? And they're still named that, right? Lake Victoria. So what they're illegally uncovering, these two just freaking heroes of mine, is how these, there's been blocks allocated to companies, especially Soko, this company I'll talk about in a second, to illegally extract oil. And what do you think is gonna happen to this lake that, that's the source of, 
a fishing economy for thousands of people. What do you think is going to happen to the lake if you start pulling oil out of it? Well, if the people rely on all the fishing and I guess all the fish from the lake, then I would assume that they're going to have a lot less food and a lot less of the money that they make if they're selling the extra fish. Yeah, and it's going to pollute the lake as well. Uh, the counter argument that Soko, Soko is the name of the company you're going to be watching about. The counter argument Soko says is, hey, we will be providing you with jobs. But then the fisher folks say, wait a minute, jobs for what, five years? And then what? Right now we have this polluted lake with, right? It's not a sustainable thing. So says the enemies of Soko. Okay. So that's the struggle between Congolese and international folks who want to protect this area to protect the people and others who want to exploit the resources of this area for export. For export. And of course, they're going to <clears throat> grease the palms of Congolese politicians and military people, which you will see. And this is also what there's numerous rebel bands, right, like uh, militia groups, right, from all over the place. There's so many of them, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda. You, they want a piece of the pie too. So all these different heavily armed interests are fighting over the potential for extreme profit in this area. And that's what the film's about. The film's about these park rangers and these couple journalists trying to save the park, not necessarily to save just the gorillas, because many of those against the park just want to kill all the gorillas. And how might, in fact, many folks who work for Soko want the gorillas gone? Why do you think so? Because they think that the only reason they're protecting that land so hard is to keep the gorillas' habitat alive and well. Yeah, because the argument is without the gorillas, there's no reason to protect it because tourists or the international eye won't be on them. So they're protecting the gorillas, not for, you know, National Geographic, let's say the daisy's sake, but that is part of it. That's a big part of it. Another part of it is just to create, just to protect a sustainable way of life for people and gorillas and all the other wildlife there. And because in part, because of the film, the splash this film made, right? I'm sorry, it's 2014, not 2004, my bad. 14. In part because of the attention this film got internationally, um, Soko pulled out, right? Pulled out of the Congo. There was a big Save Virunga um, human rights movement, a lot like there was a big movement to get rid of King Leopold. Here's uh, one of Soko's headquarters. I think it's in Vancouver, Canada. This picture was taken. And these protesters, right, these can white Canadian protesters are protesting in, there's French, right, and in English. And Virunga pulled out. Um, here's it. You'll see this guy, Andre, quite a bit in the film. Uh, ranchers get paid about 250 bucks a month, which for Congolese wages is pretty darn good. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I was about to say, uh, that's not, that's not that much money, but I didn't know, like, is, yeah, is that a lot there? Well, I wouldn't say a lot, but it, it'll get him by, it'll, he'll be able to put clothes on his kids and feed them, right? He's not going to take trips to Hawaii. <clears throat> um, oh, that's a lot of words, but I just want to give you context. So around 600 of the estimated 1,063 remaining mountain gorillas live in the countries of Rwanda, Uganda, and the Congo, right? This area right in here, Rwanda, Uganda, and the Congo. <clears throat> and it's uh, 430 square kilometers, areas of forest, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and by the way, since conservation efforts have stepped up in the 1980s, the gorilla population has more than doubled. 
So in other words, right, this is kind of a, a feel good story in a sense, right? The population of these gorillas have doubled. However, you know me, like there's an old saying, um, Americans love a tragedy as long as it has a happy ending. Right, that's not the definition of a tragedy. That's a joke. English majors would laugh at that joke. Uh, maybe it's the deliverer. I'm a bad deliverer of jokes. Because you know what happened in 2018? After people st started to pay attention to other things and not keep up pressure on the Congolese and saving the mountain gorilla, once again, the government approved illegal oil drilling in Virunga. Because remember, according to law, you cannot drill oil in this national park. <clears throat> um, in fact, the former president, Joseph Kabila, was ordered an, or awarded an oil drilling license, just to show you the level of corruption, right? And efforts are, people are still fighting in, <clears throat> in Virunga to, um, either protect it from drilling or to drill. It's still going on right now. Um, more than almost 200 rangers, this is old, these are old numbers from 2018. Since in the last five, oh, and over the last 20 years, almost 200 rangers have been killed. Isn't that crazy? And just last April, April of 2020, Rwanda rebel group coming in killed 12 rangers in one ambush and four or five others, a, a kid, a taxi driver, and somebody else. So in this area of the world, this fight is still going, and I think this cartoon captures it well, right? The people of the Congo and, um, in this case, a mountain gorilla, their habitat is going away, and there's just big piles of cash and big oil wells to be had. And there's a lot of guns, right? A lot of armaments in this area because the stakes are so high and the profit so high. Okay, if y'all have any questions, um, please Zoom me or email me and um, not forward or 14. And I hope you maybe enjoy, it's not the wrong word, but um, engage in this powerful story about Virunga. Okay. I already started a little bit of it. I think I watched the first 30 minutes and it's pretty interesting.